Welcome to this video. In this video, what we're going to talk about is the electrocardiogram, or the ECG. Now, this video will be placed in the playlist on the cardiovascular system, so if you're looking for the different parts of this video, that's the playlist that you'll be able to find all the parts of this video. Okay, right, so what are we actually going to talk about in this video? Well, firstly, what we're going to do, we're going to start off by uh, giving a basic description of what the ECG is actually going to do, and then we're going to go over s some basic cardiac physiology that we're going to need to understand in order to actually interpret an ECG. So we're going to go over the conduction system uh, through the heart, so how electrical signals actually propagate through the heart. We're also going to introduce the concept of a cardiac vector, um, which will be important in order to interpret ECGs. Then what we'll do is we'll actually talk about how an ECG is performed, and we'll actually talk about the different waves of the ECG, uh, and what they actually represent, and why they represent that, how they represent that. So we'll actually talk about why an ECG actually looks the way it does. Finally, what we'll talk about is the 12 lead ECG, which is what is actually used in clinical medicine. And the 12 lead ECG is complicated because you actually perform 12 different ECGs that all vary on the angle that you're looking at. Now, here we will not actually be discussing why uh, you use all these 12 different ECGs and what they're actually useful for. Uh, that's beyond the scope of this video, but I hope by the end of this video uh, that you will at least be able to go forth and hazard a good guess at what each of the 12 ECGs that you would get uh, in a 12 lead ECG would look like uh, from the physiology that we will uh, discuss here. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do then is give a basic overview of what an electrocardiogram is actually going to show. So the basic understanding that I want you to have right away is that the heart, it's an electrical machine. In order to coordinate the cardiac cycle, in order to get the correct portions of the heart to contract at the correct times, there is a very complicated electrical signal propagation through the heart. This electrical signal propagation causes disturbances in the electrical potential all over the body. So it causes electrical potential disturbances all over the body. The electrical potential at the different points all over the body is going to change slightly. And the basic principle of an ECG is that we are going to measure an electrical potential difference between two points, and as you're at different phases of the cardiac cycle, where the electrical signal propagation is at different points, you're going to have different electrical potentials at the two points that you're measuring the electrical potential difference between, and therefore the electrical potential difference will change. And indeed, that's what that graph that you're actually going to see, uh, the iconic graph of an ECG is actually representing. It's representing the electrical potential difference between two points of the body, and why does that change? It's because of the electrical activity in the heart. That's the basic principle of what an electrocardiogram is going to do. So what we need to understand is how does the electrical signal within the heart propagate, and then what we'll do is actually use that to understand why a certain ECG, and we will start off just with a specific ECG, i.e. we will fix two points of the body and we'll look at the electrical potential difference between those two points, and then we will understand why the graph actually shows that characteristic form. Okay, right, so then we're going to begin with a revision of the way in which the electrical signal propagates through the heart. Now, as I say, this is supposed to be a revision, so if you have never seen this before, I have a video entitled The Cardiac Cycle and Cardiac Electrophysiology, which is a more introductory guide to this. Okay, so I'm going to draw a nice simple picture of the heart, uh, like so. So I'm just going to show uh, the four chambers of the heart and the walls of the chambers of the heart. So up here we'll have the left atrium, okay? Then we'll have uh, the right atrium on this side here, then the left ventricle down here, and the right ventricle here. So here are the 
four different chambers of the heart and the nice thing about this picture is it shows all of the walls uh, of the chambers and we will be able to draw our conduction system for the electrical signal uh, on this picture nicely. Okay, so firstly just labelling up the different chambers, so this is the right atrium, and we discuss in the video on the cardiac cycle and cardiac electrophysiology exactly what this is representing. It's representing a cross-section through the heart um, at a bizarre sort of diagonal plane, uh, but it's a good plane to take because it shows us all four of the chambers. Okay, so if you're not familiar with what we're actually looking at here, I recommend you go and watch the video on the cardiac cycle and cardiac electrophysiology, which is also in the playlist on the cardiovascular system. Okay, so this is the left atrium, this is the right ventricle, and this is the left ventricle here. Okay, right, so, firstly then, where does the electrical signal that drives the heart under normal cardiac physiology originate? Well, of course, it originates in the sinoatrial node, which is this specialised cluster of cardiomyocytes in the wall of the right atrium. So I'm going to start by adding that onto our picture. So this little cluster of cardiomyocytes up here, and it's near the superior portion of the right atrium. It's actually very close to the um, place where the superior vena cava joins the right atrium. Okay, so let's say that this blob, which I'll colour in in pink here, is representing the sinoatrial node. So what will be happening is these cells will be generating action potentials rhythmically, and approximately they generate one every 0 0.8 seconds to give us a rate of 75 uh, beats per minute. Okay, so these are generating action potentials spontaneously every 0 0.8 seconds. What will then happen is they will pass these action potentials on to the neighbouring cardiomyocytes through gap junctions, as we discussed in the video on the cardiac cycle and cardiac electrophysiology, and then the signal will propagate uh, through the ventricular walls and the ventricles will contract. Now remember, it's generally believed that there are specialised conduction pathways in the atria, okay, which deliver the signal faster than it would uh, be delivered if it was just going through the contractile cardiomyocytes. So remember from the video on the cardiac cycle and cardiac electrophysiology, uh, there are two major types. There is interatrial conduction pathways, and there are internodal conduction pathways. So we think there is one interatrial conduction pathway, which carries the electrical signal from the sinoatrial node and releases it onto the left atrium to get the signal there as quickly as possible, so that we get the left atrium contracting at the same time as the right atrium. And remember, this interatrial pathway, this is known as Bachmann's bundle. Okay, so in orange here, this is representing Bachmann's bundle. We also believe that there are three internodal uh, conduction pathways which take the electrical signal and deliver it to the atrioventricular node. So remember, there is a fibrous insulation between the atria and the ventricles. Electrical signals cannot propagate from atrial cardiomyocytes to ventricular cardiomyocytes. So when uh, the electrical signal arrives at the cardiomyocytes that border this uh, fibrous um, insulation here, it cannot go any further, it cannot spread to the ventricular cardiomyocytes. The only hole through this um, insulation here, which is known as the atrioventricular septum, is in the form of the AV node here, which I will colour in in red. Okay, which for short I'll just abbreviate down to the AVN. Okay, so another part then of the atrial conduction system is these pathways which deliver the electrical signal from the sinoatrial node to the AV node, and they deliver it nice and fast. So there is a anterior one here, a middle one, which will go like so, and a posterior one, which will be on the posterior wall of the right atrium, and those are the three internodal pathways, internodal conduction pathways through at the wall of the right atrium to deliver the electrical signal nice and quickly to the atrioventricular node.
Okay, so to summarize, the sinoatrial node generates action potentials every 0 0.8 seconds. Uh, these go through the conduction system, so there is the Bachmann's bundle here, which will take the electrical signal to the left atrium, where they'll be released on the left atrial cardiomyocytes, and it will spread from atrial cardiomyocyte to atrial cardiomyocyte uh, to cause them all uh, to uh, contract. And then we also have these conduction pathways on the right side of the heart here, uh, which will take the signal to the AV node. Now, uh, and also of course, it will be released onto the normal atrial cardiomyocytes and will propagate down uh, the atria in that way as well. Okay, so, the new concept that I want to talk about here is the concept of a cardiac vector, and this concept is going to be so important for us when we are trying to understand why the electrocardiogram looks the way it does. So what is meant by a cardiac vector? A cardiac vector, the simple way of thinking about this, is just the direction in which the electrical signal is propagating. Okay. Now, a more important understanding, however, to have here is that it's actually a current. It's actually a current vector. It is showing you the direction in which current is propagating. Now, let me explain why. Remember the way in which the electrical signal propagates between cardiomyocytes. So let's say we've got two cardiomyocytes here. Okay, cardiomyocyte 1 and cardiomyocyte 2. And let's say cardiomyocyte 1 is conducting an action potential along it. So let's say it's in the wall of the right atrium here, and it's conducting an action potential in this direction. So the sinoatrial node's back here, if you like. Okay, and it's propagating away from the sinoatrial node in this direction. So the cardiac action potential is going to propagate along the membrane of cardiomyocyte 1 here. And then how does the electrical signal spread to cardiomyocyte number 2? Well, of course, it's through these electrical synapses, these electrical windows between cardiomyocytes, which are known as gap junctions. And remember, these allow positively charged ions to move from the cytoplasm of one cell to the cytoplasm of another cell. Now, when the cell membrane of cardiomyocyte number 1 near this gap junction here is undergoing an action potential, it, you have a rise in the electrical potential intracellularly. So the electrical potential inside the cell rises. That's part of the depolarization of the cell membrane. Remember, it's because sodium ions are coming into the cytoplasm of the cell. So that means that now the electrical potential of the cytoplasm inside cell 1 is going to end up higher than in cell 2. So what ends up happening is positively charged ions move from cell 1 into cell 2 through these gap junctions, and then the arrival of that positive charge here depolarizes the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane and causes an action potential in cardiomyocyte number 2. Okay, but what you have to understand is this is a current. There is an intracellular current occurring from cardiomyocyte number 1 to cardiomyocyte number 2. Now, if you think about this occurring all over the atria, you are getting intracellular current moving in the direction that the action potential, the electrical signal, is propagating down the cardiomyocytes. So really, the cardiac vector, which is the direction in which the electrical potential, uh, sorry, the electrical signal is propagating uh, down the heart, is actually representing this flow of current, and this is such an important understanding. Okay, because if we are overall moving current in a certain direction, and let's draw the cardiac vector in this case, we can see that you look, the entire signal is propagating in this direction overall. Okay, so for atrial, um, can, for the atrial portion of the cardiac cycle, the cardiac vector is clearly in this direction, going down the heart from the top where the sinoatrial node is down to where this fibrous insulation between the atria and the ventricles is. Okay, what's really happening then is loads of current, intracellular current, is moving in this direction. So actually, overall, we have a lot of intracellular current moving in this direction. Now, when you move a huge amount of charge, that's going to create changes in electrical potential. Okay, namely, you're going to find that in a body part that's down here, let's say, and this is such an important understanding, so I'll spend some time with this, 
If you have a body part that's down here with respect to the heart, say the left leg maybe, because of course the left leg will be somewhere down here, um, what's going to happen? We're bringing positive charge down here. We've got this positive current throughout the atria of the heart overall. All over the atria of the heart, we're getting positive current moving in this direction inside cells because of the fact that the electrical signal is moving in this direction. So we're actually going to be affecting the electrical potential over here. We're going to be raising the electrical potential here. So the electrical potential, which I'll call capital E here, is going to be going up because wherever you move positive charge to, that raises the electrical potential there. Whereas if I look at a point over here, let's for instance say, so this was the left leg, if I've got a point up here, which could be, for instance, the right arm, okay, you're moving positive charge over all the way from that, so you're going to decrease the electrical potential here. So the electrical potential up here will go down. So if you had, for instance, a kit for measuring the electrical potential difference between these two points, you would see a change, okay? Uh, specifically, if you were going from here to here, you would see a rise in the electrical potential difference but as this one becomes more positive and this one becomes more negative, so the difference between them is going to become more positive. That is the basic principle of how the electrocardiogram is actually going to work, but don't worry if you don't understand that, we will come back to that. Okay, for now, just understand that the cardiac vector, this direction in which the electrical signal is actually moving, represents this movement of current through the actual uh, intracellular compartments of cardiomyocytes. And understand we've got a huge number of cardiomyocytes in here all doing this. So even though the current in between just two cardiomyocytes might be tiny, when they're all summing together, they might produce a significant, measurable uh, electrical disturbance. Indeed, they are going to. Okay, so there's the cardiac vector for the electrical signal propagating down the atria then. Then what's going to happen, of course, is the electrical signal is going to arrive at the atrioventricular node, and then it will go rather slowly through the atrioventricular node. Then, of course, we know that the atrioventricular node doesn't just release it onto the ventricles, because that will cause the ventricles to contract from the top downwards. Okay, so instead what you have is the ventricular conduction system, starting with the bundle of His, which then very quickly splits into the right bundle branch here, and then the left bundle branch here. Okay, so we have uh, the bundle of His initially, which of course is in the interventricular septum here, so bundle of His, okay, that's that portion there, and then it's splitting into the right bundle branch, which for short I'll just abbreviate to RBB, so R for right, B for bundle, and then B again for branch, and the left bundle branch, which for short I'll abbreviate down to LBB. Okay, and then of course those split down further into the Purkinje fibres, so I'll put on some Purkinje fibres here in green, and the Purkinje fibres then deliver the electrical signal to the actual ventricular cardiomyocytes. And it's important to say that the electrical conduction system of the ventricles here is insulated to stop the electrical signal propagating from these conduction cardiomyocytes in the uh, bundle branches and the bundle of His and the Purkinje fibres from actually influencing these cardiomyocytes. It's insulated uh, by fibrous connective tissue. Okay, so I'll just write the final key word here, which is Purkinje fibres. So now let's talk about where the electrical signal goes to first, because this is, again, a really important point for understanding the different ways of an ECG. Okay, so remember from the video on the cardiac cycle and cardiac electrophysiology, and I keep coming back to that video, it is ideal for you to have watched that video prior to watching this video. What happens firstly is the first portion of the ventricular, ventricular myocardium to actually get the electrical signal given to it from the ventricular conduction system is the interventricular septum here. And in fact, Purkinje fibres coming off the left bundle branch here are going to deliver the electrical signal to the ventricular um, myocardium here, and it's going to propagate in this direction. So this is the direction of the electrical signal when it's actually first release. Okay, so you're going to get propagation of uh, the electrical signal up the ventricular septum here, 
in this direction. So the cardiac vector has suddenly changed direction. So now we're going to be seeing intracellular current going in the opposite direction. So you'd expect to see the opposite change in the electrical potential difference between these two points that you saw during atrial, uh, well, the signal propagating through the atrial, atrial contraction. Okay, uh, so that's the first thing that's going to happen, and we indeed we are going to see that on the ECG. Then the next thing that happens is that the actual signal arrives in the major portions of the right and left bundle branches, and it's released onto the major portion of the myocardium, this portion of the myocardium, and this portion of the myocardium. Now, importantly, the ventricular conduction system, the Purkinje fibers here, they release the electrical signal firstly onto the inner portions of the myocardium, okay, which is more fancily called the subendocardial myocardium. Okay, so the endocardium is just the endothelial cells that cover the heart, just like the rest of the blood vessels. The heart has to have endothelial cells, and those are called the endocardial cells. So subendocardial myocardium means the myocardium that is just underneath the endothelial cells, and therefore is this inner myocardium. So as shown on the picture, the uh, conduction system is in the inner portions of the myocardium, and therefore releases the electrical signal firstly to the inner portions of myocardium. So what happens is the electrical signal propagates outwards, peripherally, from the inner myocardium, the subendocardial myocardium, and sorry, this should be subendocardial rather than subendocardium, um, the subendocardial myocardium, uh, to the outer myocardium, which is known as the subepicardial myocardium. Okay, uh, so the epicardium is again a layer of cells on the outside of the heart, so subepicardial means just under the epicardium, uh, and therefore the outer portion of myocardium. So what's going to happen then is the electrical signal, the action potentials are going to propagate from the inner portion of myocardium to the outer portion of myocardium. So again, the cardiac vector, what direction is it going to point in? Well, if you sum all of these together, think of it happening all over the ventricles here, what is the overall direction you're going to get? Again, it's going to be in this direction, I hope you can appreciate. Okay, because where you've got a bit going in, in this direction, so let's say over here we have a bit like this, you'll have another bit over here like this, and those sort of currents will balance out, I hope you can appreciate. So really the cardiac vector, it's all about understanding in what direction overall are we getting intracellular current moving. And you'll see over here, although here the intracellular current is moving in this direction, up here we'll have a bit moving in that direction, and you know, both of them have a component in this direction, like so, and then they have directions in the uh, components in the perpendicular directions, and moving current like that will cancel moving current like that. So overall, we, what, when we sum all of this together and think of the summed effect, the overall net direction in which current is moving is this direction. Okay, so you'd expect when we get this major ventricular depolarization here, uh, that it would produce the same sort of shift in the ECG as when we had atrial depolarization, and indeed it will do. Right, the final bit where the electrical signal is released to is the back portions over here, the posterior portions of the myocardium. Okay, so what's going to happen is the ventricular conduction system is going to release the electrical signal and it's then going to propagate backwards, and of course the cardiac vector in that case, the direction in which the uh, current, the intracellular current will be moving, will be like so. Okay, again, the opposite direction, the same as when we had the ventricular septum uh, depolarization, when it was propagating through there. Okay, so there we have now talked about cardiac vectors. Now, one more thing that I want to do just in this introduction, because it will be important when we actually come on to understand why the ECG looks the way it does, is talking about repolarization. So we've talked completely at the moment about depolarization, and the fact that when depolarization occurs and propagates from one cardiomyocyte to the next one along, you get this current of positive uh, charge moving from one cardiomyocyte to the next one to be depolarized along. 
Now, what happens when repolarization occurs? Well, when repolarization occurs, current is going to move in the exact opposite direction. So imagine this cardiomyocyte, cardiomyocyte number one, has just repolarized, and it's repolarized before cardiomyocyte number two. Now what's going to happen is cardiomyocyte number one's electrical potential intracellularly will have returned to normal, but cardiomyocyte number two's electrical potential won't uh, intracellularly won't have returned to normal yet. So now you'll get positive charge moving in the exact opposite direction. So when we have repolarization, we're going to get positive charge, we're going to get a current moving from cardiomyocytes, but in the exact opposite direction, okay? So uh, you're going to get positive charge going into the one that is repolarizing first. So how does this work then? Well, what would you expect? And this is going to be important. Again, we need to draw a vector for this, because this is going to show up on the ECG, these currents that are moving from cardiomyocyte to cardiomyocyte because of the chain of repolarization. What I need you to understand at this stage is that repolarization occurs in the opposite order to the way depolarization occurs. Now, we're not even going to talk about repolarization for the atria because it doesn't actually even show up on the ECG, so we'll ignore repolarization of the atria. We'll just talk about repolarization of the ventricles. Now, you would expect repolarization to occur in this order. You would expect first the, the ventricular septum to repolarize, then the subendocardial myocardium, you would expect that to repolarize, then the subepicardial um, myocardium, you would expect that to repolarize, and then finally the posterior uh, myocardium, you'd expect that to repolarize. But actually, the order it occurs in is that the subepicardial myocardium repolarizes first, even though that was not the first myocardium to actually receive the action potential. It's just because those cells, they have shorter action potentials than uh, the ones that are towards the subendocardial portion. Okay, so the subepicardial myocardial cells, they repolarize first, and the wave of repolarization spreads from the outside to the inside. Now, as I say, when we've got um, the spread of repolarization, current moves, positive charge moves from the cells that haven't repolarized yet to the ones that have repolarized. So this means you're going to get current moving from inwards to outwards, okay, throughout repolarization, because the subepicardial myocardial cells, they are going to repolarize first, and the subendocardial, the inner ones, are going to repolarize last. So in fact, you're going to get another current vector, another cardiac vector, that is in this direction when the ventricles repolarize, because of the fact that the subepicardial myocardial cells repolarize first, and the subendocardial myocardial cells, they repolarize last. Okay, so understanding these current vectors, the direction in which current is moving intracellularly is absolutely essential to understanding the ECG. These current vectors, this movement of positive charge through intracellular compartments between cardiomyocytes that's occurring all over the heart, this summed effect is what gives rise to the ECG, the changes in electrical potential all over the body that we're going to see in the form of an ECG. So understanding these current vectors and these concepts that we've just been over is going to be absolutely essential. Okay, so we'll have a break here and in the next video we'll actually see our first ECG and explain why it looks the way it does.